Uh, we celebrated now uh, the Eucharist uh, outside for the last three weeks, I think. Uh, and, um, and for the most part, things have gone well. I know it's warm, um, especially when we were celebrating at 11 o'clock, but we've moved uh, that celebration to 9.30. And we may, even as the summer goes on, we may move that, that Mass uh, to an earlier time as well. Uh, it will depend on whether our, our sound people can get out and, and set up all that stuff before, before the eight, you know, an 8.30 liturgy, for example, if we decide to move it to 8.30. Um, we also may move the, uh, the evening liturgy on Sunday uh, to 7 in the evening. I've noticed uh, when I've gone over with Prudence at 7 in the evening just to, to hang around, that by then the sun's down, and uh, so the discomfort that, uh, that we may experience at 6, uh, it's amazing what the difference that an hour makes. Uh, and so we, we'll talk about that at our staff meeting and decide whether to move that uh, Sunday evening Mass to 7. If you have a thought about it too, uh, let me know. Okay, just send me an email, I'll send Father Nima or John. Um, uh, remember, uh, masks are still required, even outdoors. And someone asked uh, about the possibility of, uh, of not using them out, outside because we are distance uh, even farther than, than what the CDC is recommending. Um, but the CDC does ask that we continue to use masks outside. I and mean, if you need to pull it down on occasion just to breathe, fine. And, uh, and hopefully, most weekends won't have the kind of humidity that we had last weekend. I know this weekend promises to be really nice, um, but we'll work with that as well, okay? But uh, bring your masks. Uh, and we're trying to do everything that we could. Am I getting anything? Okay. This weekend is the Feast of the Body and Blood of, of Christ. And this is, I'm going to read two readings. Uh, the reading from Deuteronomy, the first reading, and the Gospel reading. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said to the people, Remember how for forty years now the Lord your God has directed all your journeying in the desert, so as to test you by affliction, and find out whether or not it was your intention to keep his commandments. He therefore let you be afflicted with hunger, and then fed you with manna, a food unknown to you and your fathers, in order to show you that not by bread alone does one live, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of the Lord. Do not forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that place of slavery, who guided you through the vast and terrible desert, with its seraph serpents and scorpions, its parched and waterless ground, who brought forth water for you from the flinty rock and fed you in the desert with manna, a food unknown to your fathers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to the Jewish crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors, who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. I find that this image of a people wandering in the desert uh, 
that we hear in the first reading from Deuteronomy. Um, it's familiar, uh, partially because when we started doing this video series, we were in the midst of Lent, and that is you know, portrayed as a desert in a lot of ways. Um, and it feels like the whole of quarantine was like wandering in a desert. Um, but even now, once you know the economy is opening up and we're trying to learn how to how to move beyond quarantine, in other ways, I feel like we as a church, we as a society, are are like these Israelites, wandering the same small space for forty years, unable to get out uh, because we're unable to learn how to depend on God together. Um, in a lot of ways. It seems like we've been here before as a society. There, there's not much new going on, and yet we're, we're back. Um, still learning, still trying to learn. Um, still trying to depend on, on things that clearly have been shown not to work, but we can't think of any other way. Um, and that's, it's incredibly challenging, and it's hard, hard not to forget the Lord our God, who, who's made this promise to bring us out. Yeah, and that, that, that image is like, like the second paragraph of the first reading too, like reminded like, do not forget the law, your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So yes, we've been like wondering, asking what we've been doing here, what we've been going through right now. And once again, the reading reminded us, do not forget the law, your God. Mm -hmm. Remember what in the past that he did for you. And, and, that, and that I think is what, is what the Eucharist is all about, the remembering, right? I mean, mm -hmm. whenever we um, gather at Eucharist, we, we tell the story again. Uh, it is, and it's not just the, the, uh, the memory of, of the suffering, death, and resurrection of the Lord, but, but all the things that the Lord has done throughout uh, human history, and uh, and remembering that, then we uh, are once again, I think, connected to God, and and there's 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 uh, there's the ability to trust even more. I mean, to put ourselves in a, in a place where we can trust that He will lead us, you know, beyond this present madness, mm. uh, craziness, you know. Um, as he did for the Israelites then, as he did for Jesus, you know, when he um, uh, suffered and died uh, and rose from the dead. Yeah, without, without these stories of how God is faithful, I think it's very difficult for us to have hope that God will be faithful. Mm -hmm. um, and and part, of, part of the task of, of the church is to make these stories real. You know, not just these just so stories that um, you know convince us that in some future far away place everything will be okay, but that right now God is leading us through the desert, and right now there is manna, even though it's um, it's unknown to us and to anyone who came before. That is God. When God gives us manna, I think in some sense it's always new. It's always different than what we experienced mm -hmm. before. The kind of feeding. Um, that God provides us with. You said something earlier. You said, uh, you know, that we we find ourselves even now as the Israelites wandered, you know, ourselves in much the same place that we've been before. Do you know what I mean? The kinds of sufferings that we endure. I think, at least to my mind, one of the reasons for that is that we think that we can heal it. We can fix it all ourselves. Mm. Do you know that we can that we can find? I guess by our own power, uh, solutions to societal ills and things like that. But I, but I am confident that in the wake of the of Pentecost, that we, that it is the spirit that, that transforms our world and us. Uh, we have to be open to it. So it's, it's so the spirit, uh, and, I, and I feel it uh, even now, because if, when, whenever things are out of sort, the society or myself or relationships or whatever it happens to be, it seems to me that it is in that fire, that, that, that disorder, 
the spirit is, is, is making a way to something new, do you know? Yeah. So, so while it is, and I've often felt uncomfortable, you know, with the pandemic and with all that's going on with everything around us, I, I, feel, I feel really confident that, that out of this, this, this fire and wind which Pentecost always brings uh, is something new uh, if we're open to it. Mm -hmm. If we will allow the spirit to, uh, the wind to blow through us and to renew us and to and to recreate us in our in our community in our society and all, um, but it's not our power. So it's not me doing this. It's it's me being open to it, because I'm not sure. In fact, I'm confident that I can't change myself. I can't fix me. Yeah. You know, um, and uh, but I can be open in prayer to asking this, the Spirit to come and to change me, and to change all of us. Um, yeah, I think it's no accident that, you know, God brought the Israelites out of a life um, in which they were not satisfied. They were, uh, they were slaves in Egypt. Um, and in order to recreate them anew, in order to teach them a new way to be in relationship to one another, to not just repeat what they learned at the hands of, of the Egyptians, uh, the desert was necessary, a, a place mm -hmm. of, of, of nothingness, of, um, you know, of, of the bare minimum before they could enter, you know, this, this promised land, uh, because otherwise they would just carry it all with them. They would, they would turn the promised land into, into Egypt. And of course, as, as the history unfolds, that's what happens, you know, over and over again. Um, despite the renewal, people come back and start to repeat the familiar, but God is always faithful. God always recreates the deserts in our lives so that we can learn to feed on, yes. on God alone. Yes. Right. Um, and hopefully for, for those of us who, um, who are in communion, in this communion, you know, the Sunday Eucharist can be um, not only a reminder of that, but a renewal of that covenant. But I think, um, as, as you've been saying, we, we have to accept it all, you know, we can't accept it. We can't accept the renewal without the desert. We can't accept the resurrected life without the suffering and the death that precedes it. Um, and, and part of that is in the memory, in the telling the story. But the harder part, I think, for me at least, is finding that memory in my own life. So that what happened to Jesus isn't just, again, something that happened to some guy a long time ago but something that continues to happen um, and continues to bring forth uh, the, the fruits of the Spirit. But if I can't find that in my own life, I can't see how, how the Eucharist is going to be very fruitful, right, right. Um, even as objectively real, real as it is. And, and, and I can think of times in my own life when, uh, 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 when you know, the suffering was, was a, def a desert experience, and, and uh, and connected, I mean, in reflection to you know to the Paschal mystery. Uh, and as I look back on it, and I see all that came from it, all that followed from that particular suffering in my life, uh, it does give me uh, the ability to look forward from this present moment or any other, any moment of suffering, and uh, and believe. To hold on to the, the sure hope, you know, that God will take you from here uh, to another place as well, just as He's done in the past, as as I remember. You know. And uh, I hear when you say it like, yes, we need a desert in order to be transformed, and I I think that many uh, deserts fathers they try to go into a desert and let everything go and then they kind of let that spirit work in again but first we need to let that go first what we experience or uh, what we've been remembering in the past like the Egypt the one that holding us back and as the uh, venerable Francis Xavier Nguyen Van Thuan, he said like if you go if you travel to different places and you carry everything with you you didn't go anywhere. You stayed. <laughs> yeah. So if you go there, just left stuff back. Don't don't bring it with you. Mm. 
so that in order to learn the new things, in order to let the new experience transform you. If you bring like, if you go on a vacation, you bring everything like every comfort that you can have at home. So then you stay at home better. Yeah. Right. Stay at home is better than just go somewhere and bring everything there. Right. And that and that's why the spirit is is both wind and fire. I mean, I think it's first yeah. destructive. You know, it, you don't take with you the old stuff. Right. You know, and that's the painful part. Uh, the the effects of wind and fire, the way that it blows through our lives and and upends what was comfortable before. Um, but as you say. Um, that has to come because you, because to move to the next place with what you had before, is not to have moved at all. Right. Is just to be where you were. And, so. and I think that often happens. We carry it with us because we have refused to face the truth. You know, not not a you know maybe a capital T truth, but some reality in our life that we cannot look at unflinchingly, but that we. We, we try to hide, but there are no shortcuts. You know, there, there are no end runs around the work of grace. It has to transform us from within, um, which I think, you know, the, the gospel, you know, and, and what, um, what eating the flesh of the Son of Man and drinking his blood means, um, we can too quickly move on to what happens on Sundays without seeing with you know, spiritual eyes, so to speak, um, why this is repugnant. Uh, so repugnant to us, or why this was so repugnant to um, to Jesus' hearers. Um, yeah, we were talking before, you know, how um, about uh, about the other things in our lives that are repugnant. You know how we, uh, as the some of the Jewish people in the in the gospel, um, were a little put off by Jesus Jesus' language. You know, the eating my body and drinking my blood. Um, there are there are things in our own lives that are just as as unpalatable. You know, um, we we, talk, we were saying, you know, just asking for forgiveness mm. from someone, or or um, entering into a dialogue with someone we love when the relationship's broken, to talk about things that need to be spoken about, uh, knowing that it's going to be hard. Most of us would resist that. I mean, we would. We would avoid it if we can, or right. we would avoid it as long as we can, because no one wants to eat that. You know, it's it's it doesn't taste good. Uh, it uh, often turns the stomach. You know these conversations, these encounters. Um, so there are parallels, I think, uh, between uh, the the body and blood of Christ being. Um, um, Something that's repugnant to those so many in the gospel, and and the life that the life that that is. You know, I think you know what, what we what we mean uh, when Jesus says we, we eat his body and drink his blood is we eat his his body, soul, and divinity. I mean, and that includes his suffering, mm -hmm. which is an essential part of life, an essential part of human, being a human being, uh, and. Uh, and that's not pleasant. Right. right. And not only his body, blood, soul, and divinity, but understood that you know, Jesus' body is different after the resurrection. It transcends um, material limitations. But it's also the head of the body, which is the church. Uh, there's a marvelous sermon of, of St. Augustine's where um, he says... Uh, points to the altar um, says be what you receive um, and, and the notion is that when when we receive the body of Christ we're not just receiving the individual Palestinian Jew who was tortured to death 2,000 years ago we're receiving everyone that he has brought into his body everyone that he has linked to himself through faith and love uh, and that may involve people that I don't like very much um, that is when I receive the body of Christ, I'm receiving you, and I'm receiving you um, as a communion, as one body, uh, which is why over and over again in, in St. Paul's letters, he's so bothered by things that disrupt the community of the faithful because they make the Eucharist out to be, out to be a lie. Um, 
and that you know, I think when we have very very individualistic ideas of what communion is, that it's a me and God kind of thing, um, we can quickly forget this project of, of God's, which is to bring a people through the desert together. Uh, we can think that it's just about my own survival in the desert. One of the questions that people uh, that people ask, of course, is, uh, and especially when I'm dealing with second graders who are the perverse communion, is the parents will ask, well, how father do they come uh, to appreciate um, how do our children come to appreciate uh, the the gravity, I guess, of this of, of our celebration of of, of receiving uh, the Lord in the Eucharistic you know, elements, and uh, um, and how do they come to understand that it is the real presence of Christ? You know, what is? How do you how do you explain it to a child? Yeah. And one of the things I, I've said um, over and over over the course of my life as a priest is, is that I think we come to understand that as we live, you know, um, it's, we can study it and, we, and I think they will as they get older, yeah. the children do, and, um, but, but there are things that happen, that, there are things that happen in our lives uh, where we, where our response is, if God isn't here and close to me, then I can't go on with this, you know. Um, I mean, and the Eucharist is the answer to the question that the Israelites, of course, and you know, put over and over again in the desert: Is God with us or not? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, we can't get through this if God is not with us. And the answer is the Eucharist, the, the feast, uh, the manna in the desert, the the uh, the the evidence in the actions of God that, that God is here and feeding you and giving you all that's necessary, even in the most difficult times of your life. When those times come, and the question is asked, then we, we get a deeper understanding of what it means that God is with us here, really, in this Eucharistic feast. Um, I feel it when I'm traveling, mm -hmm. you know, and, I, and I feel disconnected, and, uh, and I find a church somewhere, anywhere, and I go in for, for Eucharist, and, and once again I feel that I know who I am and to whom I belong, and you know, I can I can settle down. You know. Yeah. Um, yes, that's a hard question. Not like it is. <laughs> not like you cannot answer like at one time, and that's it. <clears throat> and I think that's the conversion too. Like it, like <clears throat> who is it that said like in, increase my faith? Said <clears throat> so help me increase increase my faith because like. Yes, I've been I've been taught since I was young. We see this is the body of Christ, but how can you live that faith every day of your life? And then whenever you go, you grow up, and everything changes, and all of that will affect the way that you believe in that saying, mm. the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. What does that make you believe in it? Yeah. Yeah, I told a story once of my mom, who is Baptist, uh, was Baptist, is Baptist. Probably still. Uh, so. uh, <laughs> uh, she, she was, yeah, she would come uh, to Christ the King for for Easter, for the Easter celebrations, and and uh, once after the Easter Mass, where there were you know sixteen thousand people at Mass, um, uh, she asked at dinner why she couldn't receive communion, you know, um, and. Uh, and I, I said to her, I said, but you know, what we, we believe that when the community gathers and we do these things, uh, God makes himself present to us in, in a very real way in this Eucharistic food, you know. Um, and she said, why would you believe that? <laughs> I thought it was going to find It's a great question. Right, why yeah, would you believe yeah. that? Uh, um, and I remember, I, I had the same question, I think, when I was, when I was, and I was thinking about being confirmed when I was an undergrad, and uh, and I was talking to Sister Ramona about this, and she said, she was explaining the the presence, the, the Eucharistic presence of the Lord, and, and the real presence. And I remember thinking, why would they believe that? Do you know? Um, and then, as I reflected more and more about what it means uh, uh, to throw ourselves into 
to our belief that God is among us and act as if we believe that God is among us. Uh, that it made all the sense in the world. I mean, we, you don't play at it. You you throw yourself into it as if you jump into as if you were jumping into water into a pool. Right. You, know, you completely immerse yourself in it, and uh, and then you, you let it take you over, as it were. Um, yeah, it's very much. Uh, at least I find the Eucharist is very much a school, as you were saying. Hmm. We have to learn how to be fed by the hidden God over and over. Hmm. Um, you know. Why, why would we believe that, that God is hidden in, in these elements? Why would we believe that God is hidden in the life of this beggar? Why would we believe that God, that we serve God when we visit those who are imprisoned? Why would we believe any of this? Right. Um, why would we believe that the Spirit is working in, in the Eucharistic feast right. in, in and among us? Right. You know? um, and everyone has to come to terms with their own why, but the point is, once you do, However you got there, your life can be transformed. Once you right. can learn how to see God right. in the Eucharist, then you can see God anywhere. Huh. And, and right. indeed, we know right. that God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. Um, the Catechism is great on this. And, and if you haven't read the Catechism on the real presence, you should. Um, when and it's um, uh, you know, developing some thoughts from the Second Vatican Council and St. Thomas, but... Um, when, when the Catechism talks about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, it's a pains to say, by saying that we believe in the real presence, we are not saying that he is not really present elsewhere. And it goes on to list all of the ways in which Christ is really present in the world, um, that is in the lives of the poor, in the lives of the oppressed, in the lives of those imprisoned, in the sacred scriptures, in the presence of the minister, all these different ways. Uh, the point is that the way that the Lord meets us in the Eucharist is very different, you know, and then we can use fancy language, like transubstantiation, to talk about just how different it is. But it's not less real, right. you know, in, in these other ways. Um, so I think that there's there's a dialogue here between being able to discern the presence of the Lord, the real presence in the Eucharist, and discern the real presence of God among us uh, at work in the world today. And when one is working, I think the other will be working too. Uh, and one is failing, I think the other will be failing too, and there's, a, a, I think, a creative tension there. Um, so that if we want to become more devoted to the Eucharist, it could help to get out and, and help people. Um, and if we want to feel more connected to others, it might help to cultivate a devotion to Christ in the Eucharist. These things both are in our favor. They both work, but it's not, not ever one or the other. I do like your idea about it being a school. You yeah. Know? yeah. Um, learning to see. Yeah. Let us pray. O oh God, who in this wonderful sacrament have left us a memorial of your passion, grant us, we pray, so to revere the sacred mysteries of your body and blood that we may always experience in ourselves the fruits of your redemption, who lives and reigns with you the Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go. Peace. You have yes. you want to say something? What do you think, Prudence? See what's in her hands. Yeah. Do you have a thought about the Gospel? No? She says, look at my belly. Yeah. She just wants you to touch it. Remember belly. Okay, okay. Right. We can do that. Trouble the water. See that.
Trouble the water. 